Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. I'm Henry Kaiser, and in this seventh episode, we're going to be focused on how do you start optimizing your 3D project so that you can host it on more platforms and get it to more of your users. We are a number of videos into our series at this point. Um, we have already created a uh, project and we have exported it to get it hosted on Sketchfab. But if you have other platforms you're intending to host on, you may have to change what you've exported in order to fit into the constraints of those platforms, or as you start working with other file types to fit into the constraints of those file types. So in this video, we're gonna really talk more about what might you need to do in order to bring your project down into a smaller size and make it more uh, flexible to work with. Now, let's take a moment to talk about the homework from last week. Um, last week, you were expected to get your uh, project that you've created uploaded into Sketchfab and then start sharing it with other people so that they can um, really provide you true feedback on how it is used in XR compared to when they were just seeing it in Blender. Uh, Rev that, uh, hopefully you've identified some key differences in the way it felt between Blender and how it felt seeing it in AR. But really the question is, what then did your users explore? Uh, did they really start looking at different areas or were they kind of uh, happy to just load up the 3D scene and they weren't really doing a lot to interact with it or engage with it? Uh, ideally with XR, you're getting people to move around. If you've got someone who's just exploring something and they're not feeling the need to move around, this is when you've kind of uh, potentially set up a composition where you've functionally made a still image uh, and they don't feel nudged or compelled to actually uh, explore it. So instead, I would say maybe restructure your layout so that not everything is front facing, but instead you're giving people a reason to go in, look around, look from a variety of angles, and that can help them explore your 3D objects as well. Um, hopefully they're starting to go where you were intending for them to go and they could get there fairly easily. Um, ideally, your best uh, position to look at something from is not a very difficult position for a user to uh, position themselves. That said, you've got this preference already up there, so now let's talk about how we get into other platforms. In the last video, we already mentioned that Sketchfab will support 100 megabytes for a free account. That size goes up with different platforms. If you're going to bring it to Spark, you're already bringing your cap down to 40 maximum. And for different filters in Spark, that number is even lower. In Snapchat, you're looking at four megabytes. TikTok, we just don't know yet at the time of this recording what size they'll support once they eventually support self-service AR public, uh, publishing. So to achieve smaller file sizes, that's one of the main things that we try to do with optimization. With optimization, there's really two main reasons we're trying to optimize a 3D asset. The first is reducing file size um, to try to fit into a platform constraints, or even if you're already fitting into a platform constraints, a smaller file size will usually improve performance across all the devices that might be trying to experience your project. Um, the way the latest iPhone runs something is not necessarily going to be as, uh, you know, it will be a lot better than an older device, but you may still have a large audience running on older devices so you want to support them as well. You may want to optimize also to remove bugs. Some things that you can do in Blender or in other 3D editing software may not actually be reflected in the objects that you export until they're permanently applied. Um, additionally, not every technique that you can even do in Blender can be exported or is supported by every file format or platform. So we need to go ahead and start adjusting our scene to make sure that you can export as much of the product that you have in Blender as possible so that it's reflected in the final platform that you're publishing on. So when it comes to reducing file size, there are gonna be three main ways that we do that. Reducing poly count, tech, uh, resizing our texture images or compressing them to change in different ways. Um, and then also uh, link duplicates. And that is a way of making two objects that are identical having them actually share their file size as opposed to running them multiple times. Um, you can more, learn more about linking duplicates as we're only going to touch on that for a brief moment, uh, but uh, that's worth noting when it comes to reducing your file size, is if you have multiple objects that are identical 
they should be links of each other and not just regular duplicates. So let's go into the first one, reducing poly count. Poly count we mentioned in the episode on searching Sketchfab is about how all three objects are made of a variety of polygons, usually triangles, sometimes quads, um, and that the more polys there are in a 3D object or in a 3D composition, the larger the file size is going to be. And if, so, of course, that then affects what platforms you can be running on and what level of performance you're getting. So, one of the main ways that we can remove poly count in a very quick, beginner friendly fashion is what's called the decimation modifier. So, what this is, is a, uh, a modification we apply to a 3D object in Blender that allows us to change from its original full size poly count and just start stripping away polygons, almost like removing pieces out of a tower of a Jenga game. If you remove some pieces, it still looks like a tower. You remove too many pieces, it no longer looks like what you're looking for because it all comes crashing down. So let's go ahead and look back at our Blender project and see a little bit about how the decimation modifier works and what we hope to achieve with it. So here we can already see the piece that we exported yesterday that it had a total file size of 25 megabytes. Well, that's theoretically small enough to fit within a Spark project, we want to bring it even lower and improve performance. So here we are with our Blender scene. We can see the various 3D pieces of our project. And for the purposes of this uh, decimation exercise, I'm going to already start with the uh, 3D rover that we joined into a single unit. If you wanted to decimate separate parts at a time, you would have wanted to have left it in its uh, many empties configuration. However, uh, this will make it a little easier for us to decimate this entire object as a whole. So right here, we can see uh, the Mars rover. Uh, and one thing we're going to turn on right now, which is actually already on in my scene, but we'll show you how to add it, is the scene information or the scene statistics. By clicking on this drop down here of viewport options and viewport overlays, um, you can click on scene statistics checkbox, and that will toggle on and off information related to the poly count. Here we can see the number of faces and the number of triangles. Um, in the case that something is a quad, the triangle count will then take those quads and of course multiply them by two. So here we can say, this is our poly count of 203,504. That's what our current scene is working with. We have five objects in the project. Right now I have one of the five selected. If I click on a different one, we can see a different of the five selected. But if I want to know more specifically about a certain object, I can click on that object. And then instead of being in object mode, I can switch into edit mode. This is also tab on the keyboard. When I switch into edit mode, this set of statistics is now specifically about the object I clicked on. So the Mars rover right now is 199,300 triangles. The title card is 108. The planet is 3,000. The pin that we created during our pin making exercise was 1,022. And our floor plane right now is just two. It is a single quad made of, which would be two triangles. So if I want to make the biggest impact on this scene right now, obviously reducing the poly count of the Mars rover from its 199,000 is the first thing we could do to have a huge impact. To talk about how decimation works, we're going to now come back over to our properties for our Mars rover. And while we've gone over object properties, we've gone over material properties, we're now going to go to this wrench icon and explore modifier properties. In modifier properties, we have the choice of adding a modifier. And from this large list of options that we have, we're going to choose the decimate modifier to do a decimation action. Adding the decimate modifier by clicking on it, we now see a couple of different things here, but the only one I would need us to focus on at this moment is that while we're in collapse, we have this ratio that starts at one or 100%. From 100%, this is telling me that it has 100% of the polygons it is designed to start with. So again, we have 199,300 as our starting point, and that's also reflected here in the face count, 199,300. As we decimate, we would pull this slider downwards by clicking and dragging on it, and looking a bit at our rover, we can see 
that there are some changes occurring. Now, obviously, if I bring this all the way down to zero, I now have a version of the rover supposedly running on 1,388. However, clearly the rover is not capable of being rendered with just 1,388 when it was originally designed for 199,000. So this massive reduction does cause our Jenga tower to kind of collapse and we're not able to render it with this level of decimation. Bring it back to 100. Let's show you what this looks like in wireframe. So in wireframe, we can see all of the various parts that are here. And as we start removing pieces, what's happening is edges are being just literally pulled out and the software is trying to patch over that by connecting up some of the pieces that no longer have an edge connecting them. But eventually we start to get to too few lines and you can see that it's all starting to break down. So really decimation can be a bit more of an art than a science. It's about figuring out how far can I reduce this while it still looks to the naked eye like the object I'm trying to represent. So what I'm gonna try to do right now is maybe just bring it down 50%. I can do this by clicking and dragging or when in doubt, I can also just click on the ratio and change it to a certain number. So here we'll do 0.5 to represent 50%. With 50% decimation, this object still looks fairly close to what it's meant to represent. Decimation does allow us to pull about half of this large poly count object um, out of, of its normal state and compress it down without it being distorted. And that already has removed over 100,000 polygons from our project. So with that set, I think we're comfortable having decimated this by 50%. All we need to do now is apply this modifier before we export. So to apply a modifier, we will come over to this drop down just next to the word decimate, and we will hit apply. This can also be done by putting your cursor over it and hitting control A. With that applied, this model is now permanently a, uh, less than it previously was. It's now 99,650. We could also decimate all the other objects that are in our project. We could take this sphere, this sphere for example, and we could decimate it quite a bit. Oh, please be, sorry, decimations don't occur while you're in object mode or in edit mode. They only occur when you're in object mode. So decimating this sphere, you can see it starts to break down as you come too low, but it's always possible we could let the sphere exist, you know, around the 2000 poly mark. Um, I'm going to leave it back at 3000. It's diminishing returns for me to decimate much further than that. But again, with ourselves at 100,000, let's now export and see where our project at is file size uh, compared to what we exported before. So file, export, GLB. We navigate back to our exports folder. And we can call this one where it landed and just for ourselves we'll call it decimated we go ahead and we press export and here in our folder we can now see we've already gone from 25 megabytes to 18 just about 18. so we've carved off seven megabytes just by going ahead and doing a decimation action which only took us a moment other things you may want to then try is optimizing your textures. So to optimize the textures, generally that involves two things, resizing them or compressing them into a different file format or a more compressed form of the existing file format. To resize textures, what you'll generally want to do is not using the layout tab, but using the UV editing tab. Here we can find the images that are currently loaded in our project they will, all our images in our project will be loaded here in this images dropdown from the graphics on the side of the arm of the rover, the normal maps that are going ahead and being uh, applied to distort things, base color placards, everything that's currently being used in the presentation of our 3D scene is here in this dropdown. What we'll want to do is we'll want to resize then these images to reduce their file size. This can be done by just clicking on image, resize, and typing smaller values into these boxes. Most commonly, 
textures in 3D software are 1024 by 1024, 2048 by 2048 of something of, of moderate importance, or if you have an object that needs to be inspected very, very closely, you may go 4096 by 4096. But with each change up from 1024 by 1024, your file size is going to get between four and eight times larger, depending on what file type you're saving as. So I tend to keep almost all my textures 1024, or in some cases, 2048. Also, they're usually square, with the rare exception being for some spheres, because spheres are often textured with a ratio of two to one. So with that done, we can go ahead and show resizing, let's say one of these textures. How about we resize this image of the margin surface? We'll come to resize, and maybe instead of 1024 by 1024, we'll do 512 by 512, the next level smaller than 1024 by 1024. By resizing the image, you shouldn't see any visible change to what you've already got loaded into your Blender project. Although if you get very close, you may see a bit more pixelization, but we also now need to save this changed graphic. So come to image, save as, and choose your file format. And unless you have an image that has only a few hex values, like a graphic, uh, generally you'll want to use a JPEG compression JPEG can compress images of many color variables with a lower file size than PNGs can. So we're going to then go from JPEG and we'll do a quality of just 70 or 75. And we're going to save this into either our images folder or maybe a different folder that you maybe call textures. So here in our images folder, we'll then resize from the 163 kilobytes we previously had. This texture image will now become smaller to just 18 kilobytes, writing over the previous one. Also, if you have textures that are PNG, again, you should save all of those as JPEG, unless you needed transparency in that texture, because JPEG does not support transparency while PNG does. For things you download from Sketchfab, it's much more common to find the textures or 4096 as you download them, and you'll want to do a lot of image resizing in order to bring your project and file size down. The second part of optimization is about minimizing the risk of bugs. So there will be two things I'm generally trying to solve in those cases. Just fitting myself to 3D best practices, as well as fitting in the GLTF constraints. So some of the best practices of 3D software is you will work with texture images that are squares. So the width of the dimensions equals the height of the dimensions. Also, they're usually a power of two. So I've already mentioned 1024. 2048, 4096, 512, those are all the number two to some exponential power. Uh, this is just, again, standard best practices with the 3D industry. It's not a hard and set rule that must be done to fit every platform. But if you're working with some older platforms, that may be something that's expected. Additionally, uh, when you're exporting to bring into a different platform, you want to be removing the lights and the cameras out of the project because every platform will then add their own lighting and camera systems generally. So here we can already see we have that set up for our Blender project. We have no cameras, we have no lights, but you may have downloaded things that brought in lights or brought in cameras. Maybe you still have them there from when you started a new project. Make sure those are removed before you export. As far as constraints around GLTF, again, Blender has some great guidelines you can use to read about what should be supported and how you might want to structure the various things in your project. We talked about applying your decimation modifier, but other objects that you download may have a lot more modifiers running. So again, check for that blue wrench icon that appears next to uh, your object in the scene collection, because that means in the modifier properties, there will be some unapplied modifiers. You'll want to apply all of those, except for character models that use an armature and also have animations. The next step is also checking shaders. We mentioned in the last video that if you export a file and you find the colors aren't rendering the way that you see them in Blender, that may be because the Blender software supports lots of different ways of coding up color to be presented to the user on the screen. However, GLTF only supports limited ways of structuring the connections between images, the rendering uh, shaders, the outputs to the 3D file. And so what we generally have to do is simplify our shaders. 
In Blender, there is a workspace specific for shading. If you click on that workspace, as I've done just now, you can see here on the, uh, let's see, we're working with the Mars planet for a moment. This planet involves a number of images, a base color image, an emissive image, and a normal map image being plugged into a shader called a principal BSDF shader, and then which is eventually output to render on the object, uh, especially when it's actually being exported. So here we can see that this image is being connected with its color to the base color. This image is being connected with its color to the emission color input, yellow to yellow. And then the normal map, which we talked about, is the artificial embossing that you might do on certain objects, kind of help give it depth when the polygons aren't actually being re-sculpted. This image is being connected to a normal map shader technique, which then plugs into the principal BSDF shader. So this is all connected in a way which is supported by Blender, which is excellent. However, you might find, as you can see on this slide, some shader trees that are far more complex than this. Um, and what you'll likely want to do is try to, if something's not working, connect the orange image texture directly to the green shader, directly to the red material output with as little other nodes in between. By simplifying that tree, you're increasing the likelihood that the texture is going to correctly export. And you can learn more about that on Blender's website. So with your project more optimized to prepare to export, you can begin bringing it into other platforms. Here are two great tutorials on Spark and setting up your project for Spark. Uh, one actually by the Spark Creator Group on YouTube. The other is a great uh, introduction on preparing your Blender project to get imported into a Spark project and it will walk you all the way through as well. Your homework for this week is to go ahead and reopen your project from session six Decimate your objects, resize all of your texture images to 1024 by 1024, save each as a JPEG as with compression 70 unless transparency is involved, and then extra pro export your project again. Compare the two file sizes, and as a bonus, if you've gotten that project to a small enough file size, try bringing it into a Spark AR and upload your package so that you can actually share it on your social media account. We'll see you in the next episode to talk about photogrammetry.